and we'd like to show it to you today for the first time. And we call it the iPad. This is what it looks like. I happen to have one right here. That's what it looks like. It's been 10 years to the day since Steve Jobs walked onto that stage and introduced us to what we now know as the iPad. This tablet computer really did change the game in a lot of ways. The iPad was in development before the iPhone, but when Steve saw multi-touch technology for the first time, he knew he would have to shift focus on bringing it to a phone first. But after the iPhone launch, his attention quickly turned back to the iPad. At the time, the iPad, like most good Apple products, was mocked from everything from its design, which many complained was just a big iPod touch, to its name, which people compared to feminine hygiene products. But the iPad was much, much more than just a big iPhone. It was a magical glass portal into another world. So for this video, let's take a trip back in time and revisit the original iPad that Steve Jobs showed off just 10 years ago and compare it to Apple's most recent vision for the iPad, the iPad Pro, to see what's changed since those 10 long years and to see what stayed the same. For me, the unifying vision of the iPad has always been a product that is molded out of a sheet of aluminum and glass into a multi-touch computer that you can easily carry around with you and use anywhere. This 2010 iPad is a 16 gigabyte model, the entry level model at the time, which retailed for what I thought was a really low cost of just $500. For reference, my 2018 iPad Pro has 256 gigabytes of onboard storage and can be maxed out at one terabyte of storage, and those configurations can cost upwards of over $1,000. But it's not like Apple has just moved the needle on iPad pricing higher because they've actually made it lower over the years as well, with the regular iPad now retailing for just $329. The design at the time was pretty stunning, with Steve Jobs even referring to it as thin on stage. Very thin. That thin iPad is 13 millimeters thick. For reference, the modern iPad Pro is just 5.9 millimeters of thickness, making the original iPad more than twice the thickness of the new 2018 iPad Pro. In fact, it's so thick you can literally slide the iPad Pro under it. This sleek tablet of the future weighed in at just about 1.5 pounds. Actually, not too bad even for modern standards. But for reference, the modern 11-inch iPad Pro weighs in at just over a pound, and the bigger 12.9-inch iPad Pro actually weighs less than the original 9.7-inch iPad Pro at just 1.39 pounds. The 9.7-inch display came with a resolution of 1024 by 768 surrounded by thick black bezels on every side of the device. It also had flat edges, a single mono speaker, a 30 pin connector, which debuted on the iPod and a home button. A home button that is just a home button without any biometric touch ID security system behind it. Which means when you wake the iPad up, you just slide to unlock, passcode optional. Today's iPad Pro has a uniform bezel much like the original one, but it's much slimmer and supports a way higher resolution display at 2388 by 1668. The home button? Gone, replaced with a new gesture system, the speaker system upgraded to two top and two bottom firing speakers. And the old 30 pin connector, now a high speed USB-C connection. Cameras, non-existent on the original iPad Pro with neither a rear facing or a front facing camera. Today's iPad Pro has a rear 12 megapixel camera and a seven megapixel front facing camera complete with an advanced face unlocking system. We went from an iPad with no cameras to the very likely announcement of the next iPad Pro supporting four separate cameras. And the processing power, a single core one gigahertz 32 bit A4 chip on a 45 nanometer process. The 2018 iPad Pro has an octa-core 2.49 gigahertz seven nanometer CPU, which is more powerful than some PC laptops. The iPad software at the time used what is referred to as skeomorphism design. 
Skeomorphism is the design concept of making items represented resemble their real world counterparts. To put that into basic terminology, if you opened up the Notes app, you were greeted with an application that resembled a real world yellow legal notepad, complete with leather stitching. The Contacts app resembled an old school contacts book that your parents might pull out to locate your uncle's phone number. The calendar, textured and lined, complete with realistic page turns by the slide of a finger. And just look at the YouTube app icon, an old school tube TV that would be downright confusing to any Zoomer watching this video. Today, skeomorphism is mostly seen as an ugly blight on the software, with most people preferring the modern flat designs like you get on the latest iPad OS. But in defense of skeomorphism, this was a brand new paradigm, a new multi-touch interface that paralleled real world examples. So any average Joe could pick up an iPad and knew exactly what each app was and more importantly, how to use it. Using this software in 2020 is interesting, partly because so many parts of the software are no longer supported while others still work okay. For example, you can mostly get by using the Safari web browser. At the time, Apple decided not to support the popular Flash plugin, a controversial move to say the least. Today, no Flash, no problem, and most parts of the web work fine even on the first generation iPad with a few hiccups here and there. Other parts of iOS 5 on iPadOS are less forgiving. I was able to open the default YouTube app and to my surprise, I could even get the featured page to load and show some videos. And if I tapped on them, they played in this old alien YouTube interface. Searching for content popped up results. Greg's Gadget's channel on a 2010 iPad, a bizarre experience, but one that wouldn't play any searched videos no matter how hard I tried. I could even browse the App Store and see most of the modern apps that I would use on my current iPad Pro. Could I download them? No, in fact, I couldn't even sign on using my Apple ID because there was no prompt to enter a two-factor verification code to sign into a device running iOS 5, the latest software version supported on the original iPad. So my experience of using a 2010 iPad in 2020, not so great as most of the stuff on here really just doesn't work anymore. But I did find some newfound respect on the simplicity of this original iPad design. I'll remind you that this is a product that was completely developed out of pure spite. Steve Jobs was having dinner with a Microsoft engineer and when the Microsoft engineer was talking about Windows tablets, Steve Jobs had a lot of criticism about the way that Windows was pursuing these tablet operating systems. To quote the late Steve Jobs, as soon as you have a stylus, you're dead. I was so sick of it that I came home and said, F this, let's show him what a tablet can really be. Now, 10 years later, the thinking has changed. Apple has its own stylus, although to be fair, Jobs was mostly talking about the main input device of the tablet, which he thought should be your fingers. And even though many mock the Apple Pencil as the stylus Steve Jobs never wanted, it's not a main input device. It's a device that's for artists and creatives to give them more precise control but not a mandatory peripheral like it was on Windows tablets in those early days. Another added peripheral, a smart keyboard attachment which now graces most of the iPad lineup. Although the original iPad did support a keyboard dock, but in a much less elegant way. But strangely, in a way, I feel that the modern iPad Pro doesn't exactly live up to the vision that Steve Jobs had for the original iPad. My iPad Pro is usually sitting inside of a keyboard case, unlike the original vision for the iPad that was supposed to be a slab of aluminum with this multi-touch technology glass that was always ready to be picked up and turned on and ready to use within an instance. And the original iPad was pitched as a device in a third category, one that was between a smartphone and a laptop, while the modern iPad marketing campaign is usually pitched 
at replacing a laptop. Although the original iPad was slammed mostly as a consumption device, one that could not enable the creative endeavors so many on the Mac were used to, it was a criticism that Steve Jobs took to heart and it frustrated him. Today's iPads are way more creative than the original iPad with advanced photo, video, and music editing apps, and artistic drawing and painting apps that enable immense creativity with tools like the Apple Pencil. Still, some things never change. The iPad is still primarily a multi-touch interface, a magic piece of glass that can be almost anything you want it to be. A device where there is no wrong way to hold it, and it's a versatile device, one that can browse the web, compose an email, take notes, read a book, or even watch a movie. And even until today, that is what makes the iPad such a magical experience. All right, everyone, hopefully you enjoyed this look back at the original iPad, which again, is 10 years old today. I would love to hear in the comments below some stories or experiences you have had with iPads over the years, so I am really looking forward to reading that. Also, let me know in the comments below, what do you think is the biggest change from the original iPad to the modern iPads of today. As always, if you like this video, make sure you give me a like. If you wanna see more from my channel, make sure you're subscribed. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you all in the next video. Take care, everyone.